ago, I was in Berlin and I had a craving for chocolate. I went to the store and saw this chocolate bar. On the packaging it said that by buying five bars, I would be planting one tree. After all, it was the good chocolate. And what could be bad about planting trees and eating chocolate at the same time? Trees sequester carbon, filter the air, they provide shade and shelter, and they reduce stormwater runoff and the urban heat island effect. Trees are pleasing to look at. They also have positive psychological effects and they create place and space. In 2019, after moving to Philadelphia, I signed up for Smart Energy. I promptly received a certificate announcing that a tree would be planted. However, as with the chocolate, I was not informed where the tree came from and where and when the tree would be planted. I therefore felt quite removed from the actual activities that were supposed to follow my acts of consumption. I could not help but think that while these trees would indeed be grown, the fact that I still had to consume so that they would be planted suggested a form of greenwashing. The reason why we may feel removed from these types of tree planting initiatives is, of course, because they often occur far away and outside of our cities. But with increasing urbanization and climate crises, it is important that our cities, too, become greener. Just imagine, the UN predicts that by 2100, there will be almost 11 billion people living on this planet. That's around 3 billion more than today, and it is mainly urban areas which are expected to absorb this growth. Here in the US, four-fifths of the population live in urban areas already, so we need to plant trees and care for them in our cities. But why exactly can it be important to plant trees along streets in the first place? Why is every single tree important? And how can it affect positive change on a global scale? Let me give you some examples from my research as a historian of urban landscapes. The realization that trees can mitigate the climate and reduce urban heat is not new. Already in the 19th century, this was a known fact. In New York City, in the 1870s, the eminent physician Stephen Smith argued that trees could save human lives. He discovered that child mortality in the city correlated with high temperatures. And to lower the temperature, he recommended planting street trees. Because the city was unwilling to care, street tree planting had to be undertaken first as a private and then as a private public enterprise, which it often still is today. Many of the early promoters of street tree planting were women. Wealthy female New Yorkers, for example, embraced street trees as a means and symbol of empowerment, emancipation, and even resistance. Initiating street tree count planting campaigns already before obtaining the right to vote, women left their homes to plant trees in the public urban realm, claiming their right to occupy these spaces for five men. Some decades later, in the 1960s and 70s, street tree planting became a means for African-American citizens in the underfunded neighborhoods of New York City's Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant to reclaim their right to the city. They reacted to discrimination and public disinvestment in their neighborhoods by planting trees. Inspired by their grassroots initiative, the city began a tree matching program. For every four trees a block association planted, it would now receive six additional ones from the city. In the 1980s, in socialist East Germany, 
during the Cold War, grassroots tree planting initiatives gathered together like-minded people in environmental groups. These groups played an important role in the formation of opposition against the German Democratic Republic's dictatorship, and they ultimately contributed to its fall 30 years ago. What do these diverse stories have in common? They show that environmental and social concerns often go hand in hand. They also reveal that even a single street tree can bring people together. Street trees, these seemingly subtle features and often delicate but robust plants, have contributed to catalyzing big transformations and positive change. Just look at what our cities would be like without trees. Trees make a difference outside cities as well, of course. Even if you cannot feel and hear the difference right now, you can see the difference trees make. And yet, not everybody likes trees. In fact, for as long as we have been planting trees along streets, people have also been complaining about them. And they have been complaining about the same or similar things. For various reasons, trees can appear as nuisances. But tree planting initiatives can be threatening for another reason. As the early tree planters knew already, trees increase property prices. They are a financial asset. New trees, therefore, often signify the gentrification of neighborhoods and the displacement of their citizens. And indeed, scientists have not only found ways to monetize trees in terms of real estate. Trees' capacity to sequester carbon, reduce pollution and energy consumption, and decrease stormwater runoff has also been monetized. In the process, trees have become abstract numbers and dollar amounts. This quantification has done much for greening our cities. But despite the benefits trees provide us with, many cities are losing trees. You may have seen scenes like these. Many cities are not replanting enough trees to replace those that die of more or less natural causes. A 2018 study showed that tree cover in many urban areas in the US, including Philadelphia, was on the decline. Although some cities have significantly boosted their number of trees in recent years. In addition, in many cities, the tree canopy is unevenly distributed. Scientists have shown that street trees are often prevalent in wealthier neighborhoods, while they are lacking in poorer urban areas. But doesn't everybody have a right to trees? We need to make sure that everybody has access to nature in the city. And street trees are a way of providing that public access to nature to everybody. But as we have seen, neither are we planting enough trees, nor are they always planted in the right places and cared for. So there are problems, and one of them is this. We know how to quantify and monetize certain tree benefits, but how do we account for trees' other benefits, their beauty, for example? We need the science, but we also need to explore and tell the stories related to trees and nature more broadly. It is trees' immaterial benefits, such as beauty, cultural significance, and shared psychological effects that can generate the crucial empathy for trees and nature as a whole that is needed to combat climate crises and to work for environmental and climate justice on all scales, on the scale of the individual street and neighborhood, the scale of the city, the region, and the entire planet. When the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize laureate Vangari Matai in 1977 began the Green Belt Movement in her native Kenya, she had a global vision. 
How did she begin realizing it? Matai and her colleagues taught people, in particular women, how to plant, cultivate, care for, and use trees. Why? Because she knew that something as simple as tree planting could address environmental degradation, deforestation, and food insecurity, while also creating a platform for tackling the underlying issues of disempowerment and disenfranchisement. Restoring the land through tree planting has become a way to improve entire livelihoods in Kenya and beyond. Today, the Great Green Wall Project is the biggest comprehensive tree planting initiative outside of urban areas. Its size and international scope are unprecedented, involving the lands on a nine mile wide belt running across the African continent. The project seeks to combat desertification within the semi-arid Sahel. What stood at the beginning of the project? The planting of trees. But the project's leaders quickly realized that simply planting a green belt of trees would not work. Besides international cooperation, to make real change, the project demands not only site-specific knowledge of the environmental conditions, it also requires knowledge of the many local cultural traditions, of local farming practices and food production, and of the respective cultural understanding and importance of trees. It requires knowing how people relate to trees and their environment, which is something we can learn by researching and listening to their stories. By planting and caring for trees on our streets, we are able to bring nature nearer to people who in increasing numbers will be living in cities in the future. And while we clearly need the large-scale planting activities to combat climate change, these initiatives alone are far from enough. And in fact, they can be a convenient way to cover up many pressing issues we need to face and tackle. Among many other things, we simply need to consume less. We also need to design and build our cities differently so that they provide healthy homes to all people as well as flora and fauna without compromising the density, urbanity and cultural diversity that make our cities. No city and no tree are alike. Located in different climate zones, they require different treatments. But already every tree which is planted and cared for will make a change. It will make a change not only by providing environmental benefits, it will also make a change through fostering empathy for nature as a whole, so that those large-scale tree planting initiatives out in the forests of Pennsylvania and along the semi-arid Sahel will receive our necessary support. So go out and plant a tree or care for a tree. And if you do need chocolate, then buy the good one. <laughs>